morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Welcome to 2022. Wow, 2022. And with everything that 2020 and 2021 threw at us, we still know, thanks so much, we still know that God has absolutely nothing but the best plan for us this year, correct? He has absolutely new things for us in this new year. We can expect great things because our God is good and faithful. There is no regression in God's kingdom. There is no going back in God. We go from glory to glory. That is his promise over us. And it doesn't matter what the natural looks like. This is our spiritual truth. We can expect this year new revelation of who he is. We can expect new hunger for Jesus. We can expect new submission to the Holy Spirit for the things that he wants to accomplish through us this year. There are new heights in God that we can look forward to this year, a greater living out our identity as children of his. You know, we have a greater expectation this year because our God is good 100% of the time. This message is called New Heights. And the theme for January is new because God is doing a new thing. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the privilege of being here, for sharing what I really feel is on your heart for this season. That you are excited for us to step into what you have in 2022 and beyond. Thank you for your encouragement in this season. Thank you for your encouragement in this time of of chaos in the natural. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that we know that we can always turn to you for questions, for encouragement, for empowerment. And I pray, Holy Spirit, just that your your presence will be tangible this morning as I share. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. And that's it. New Heights. We believe that God has for us more blessing this year, more promotion this year, because we know that God, in this covenant relationship that we have Him, is always faithful to do His part. But we know that we have our part to play in this covenant as well. And it is our part to play in partnering with God to recognize his faithfulness. So when I say new heights, we have to start with the correct heart position. We have to start from a place of humility so that God can raise us up to new heights. God always looks for the heart. He always looks to motivation. So it's really important for us to be able to adopt the correct posture so that we can receive the blessing from God. And more importantly, so that we can be the blessing for God, for others, through everything that he wants to give to us this year and beyond. Humility is a spiritual principle. It is part of right standing with God. Humility allows God to do things for us and through us. And I think as we start looking at humility and what it is, it's also important to take a brief moment to look at what humility isn't. Humility is not an unnecessarily lowering of our self-worth. It's not unnecessary criticism of ourselves in an effort to be lowly. No, that's not humility. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and there are gifts in us and talents and dreams that God is asking us to express as full children of his. God knew before the beginning of the world that you would be here today. And there are things that he has entrusted to us for such a time as this. We are called to be a light. We are called to be that city on the hill, not hidden. We are called to be reflective of his goodness, his love, his faithfulness. We are called to be a reflection of his power, authority, and his promises. We have a confidence in God, and therefore he's asking us to have a confidence in what he has entrusted to us. And yes, it is possible, and it's important to understand that there is a difference. It's possible to be humble and confident. And my first point is just that. Humility is a matter of the heart. And we're going to look at a couple of very important people in the Bible. We're going to be looking at the stories of King Saul and King David, whose lives were intertwined, who had very similar beginnings, but who had very different ends. And their stories are great examples of what it can mean to have a heart of integrity, of humility before God. But it's also a tale of caution 
that shows us what happens when a heart, when it strays from its first love, when it strays from God, the consequences of that. So in the two books of Samuel in the Old Testament, we are told of the lives of Saul and David. And in Samuel 1, chapter 9, we are introduced to Saul in verse 2. And he is stated as being a choice and handsome son. In fact, it continues that there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So in the natural, Saul had a pretty decent head start. And it's not long into this chapter that we see you know, God's prophet Samuel come and declare over Saul that he is going to be king over Israel. And I want us to, to take these words of Saul uh, in mind because I will come, be coming back to them in a little bit. Now Saul's response to Samuel's proclamation over him is this. Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? So here we understand that Saul comes from a humble background and is about to be anointed king. And not just that, but very quickly, we see the Spirit of God descending onto Saul, and he starts to prophesy. So here we have Saul about to begin his reign as king, and he is directed by God, and he is empowered by God for this season and for this responsibility. However, it does not take long for Saul to start to drift from God's perfect plan. And we start to see a corrupting of the place of humility that he started. Saul starts to make rash decisions. He starts to make decisions out of the will and guidance of God that have far-reaching consequences. Saul forgets who he is apart from God. This culminates in chapter 15, when God commands Saul to wipe out the entire nation of Amalek, including all livestock. And Saul obeys only partially because he keeps the king of the nation alive and actually keeps some of the livestock as a spoil of war. His reasoning when confronted by Samuel is that he wanted to keep the livestock as a sacrifice to God. But this isn't what God had asked him to do. No, in fact, Samuel actually says, you know what? God, God's heart is not in the sacrifice. His heart was in obedience. Saul's heart here was no longer after God's heart. He was making decisions and operating out of his own understanding, his own ego. God removes his anointing from Saul. And he removes Saul as king eventually as well. And as we talk about humility as a heart position, I wanted to jump back to what Saul said at the beginning. Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? Am my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? Is it not possible that these words showed an insecurity in Saul? That it's not so much a humble heart that we see here but an insecure one, not certain of his value. And I think this, this corruption of self was a poison that we start to see very quickly because the matters of the heart, our heart, come to the surface quickly under pressure. And it's not long before Saul slides into rebellion in his position of responsibility. And this is a huge contrast to David, who also had humble beginnings, a shepherd of seemingly no consequence. I mean, David's legacy, as we look back, is one of someone who had passion for God, of the things of God. God himself calls David a man after his own heart. And we know that David was not perfect, far from it. I mean, we know that there was adultery. There was even murder in some sense. But yet, David's legacy is one of integrity before God because God looks at the heart. And so I think there are two lives. It's a very important distinction to make. When the Philistine army came against the nation of Israel and when the giant Goliath was the threat and had everyone trembling in their boots, when the entire nation of Israel refused to go up against that threat, David boldly took on the challenge. And David at this point was actually serving Saul. And David approaches Goliath in boldness, in confidence, not in himself. He has confidence in the God who spared him and protected him while he was shepherding him protecting him from the lion and the bear. He knew that God was going to deliver the Philistines into the the hands of Israel. David was bold, bold in God, confident in his maker. And it's here that we make that important distinction again. Confidence is not the same as arrogance. The lives of David and Saul stayed intertwined until the death of Saul, unfortunately, in battle. But before that, when Saul, having been stripped of God's favor and anointing, sees that same favor on David expressed in such a powerful way, 
he becomes jealous. He resents David. He resents this young man who has stepped into this place. Saul's insecurity could not handle to see another man in the place that he once stood. However, David did not let Saul's murderous intent, because Saul wanted to kill him and actively tried to kill him for, uh, for a decade. And David's heart was not swayed by this. In fact, David had two times we had the opportunity to take Saul's life which would have solved his problems, but he didn't. David's heart stayed humbled, and it stayed honorable to the person that he knew had originally been God's chosen. He showed honor to a man who at this point possibly did not deserve honor, but that was, that was David's heart. And so because of David's heart, God was able to take him to new heights. We achieve new heights in God when we keep our eyes and attention on him, when we seek after his heart and his values and his truth, and not just in general, but also those things in us, his value of us, his truth over us, who we are in him. A few years back, there was a popular a statement that was made within certain uh, Christian circles talking about evangelism and what evangelism was. And it was simply this, that as a Christian, I am a beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. It sounds good. It sounds like it's made from a place of humility. But what does, actually, what does God actually say? What does the Bible tell us of who we are? Now, I am, as a Christian, what the Bible says is a new creation. This isn't a turn of phrase. This is a spiritual truth because once I was spiritually dead in sin. And through what Jesus did on the cross, through his sacrifice, through me saying yes to that sacrifice, I am now fully restored in my sonship, in my relationship with God and all that means and that entails. We are, as the word of God puts it, seated in heavenly places now. This is my identity now, not something that I will be standing in in the future. This is now. Jesus' death on the cross is, an, uh, uh, you know, it's a once-for-all sacrifice. It is finished. This is where we see total restoration to our original purpose of relationship with God. One where we can boldly stand before our Father God, secure in his love and his care over us. The Bible does not call the followers of Jesus sinners. No, the Bible calls us saints because this new label is, it is indicative of our new identity. Now, indeed, this is, this is an identity that we need to align ourselves with through process, through transformation. But we let the Holy Spirit over time Guide us into the truth of who we are now so that our outward actions reflect an inner spiritual truth. Absolutely. We are called to walk in the spiritual duality of authority in Jesus, but submitted to him. We are called to the duality of power, but humility. And as I talk about walking in identity and we talk about Jesus, I think the following verse helps to keep things in perspective. Philippians 2, 6 to 11 talks about Jesus and says the following. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility does not take away from who we are in Christ, just as it did not take away from who Jesus was and what he operated in. He walked in power and authority. However, his motivation was absolutely selfless. He needed no recognition from the miracles he did. He needed no accolades or celebration from the people he taught. Far from it. In fact, Jesus asked the people who he healed, don't share this, don't tell anyone. That wasn't his motivation. And yet he still operated in power. Yes, absolutely. The Jesus who is fully God 
chose to wash his disciples' feet. Yes, Jesus, who has legions of angels at his command, never spoke out of pride or selfishness. Jesus, who in his absolute power could have stepped down from the cross at any time and yet chose to endure absolute agony and shame for our behalf. Jesus, through whom everything was created, being the pinnacle of humility, never once, to, never once chose to hold his divinity over anyone. Jesus' life displayed absolute confidence in who he was and set the perfect example of absolute power tempered by absolute humility. He knew who he was. Verbally, he affirmed that he was the Messiah, the one to come and save the world. He knew, but that was not something that he held over on, and he served out of love. And we are called to do the same. Do you know why? Because my second point is this. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, 14 says the following. And here it's actually the psalmist, King David, who says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And here we're not talking so much about, of course, our physical selves. We are talking about our identity. Fearfully, when translated from the Hebrew, means with great reverence, heartfelt interest, and with respect. Wonderfully, when translated, means set apart and unique. The root word for fearfully here in the Hebrew is actually yare, which is spelled ye, sorry, Y-A-R-E. And the context in which this word is used, it means to cause astonishment and awe, or to be held in awe. So our God, our Heavenly Father, created us to be set apart, to be unique, and to be held in awe, because we are made in His image. And as Christians who have been restored to that original purpose, as, as sons of the living God, as daughters of the living God, as new creations, we need to walk out of that original purpose. We are called to be good stewards of what he has placed in us, of what he has always intended for us to walk in and to show the world. Humility is a healed response to the questions, where does my sense of value, my sense of wealth come from? Where does my, my validation come from? Where does my protection come from? Humility is rooted in the heart, as we mentioned, and it's rooted in confidence. It's rooted in perspective. And when I say it's rooted in confidence, we touched on that a little earlier, but as we continue in our relationship with God, as he shows himself to be 100% faithful, 100% good, 100% loving, our confidence in him grows. Our trust, our faith allows us to be transformed by the inside out so that we will know that our God has us. And as we let the Holy Spirit show more and more of who he has made us to be, as he shows us the dreams that he has placed inside us, as we start to live out transformed ways of showing our gifts and talents, we grow in the confidence of our identity in him. And when I say that humility is rooted in perspective, it's just simply this. God is God. He is the creator. Everything else is created. There is nothing of good in me outside of God. I can achieve nothing worthwhile or of eternal value outside of God in my own strength. I know that I am standing here today not for any other reason except for I said yes to Jesus. He did everything so that I could say yes. He has called me to this place. There is nothing that I can boast about because it's not me. No matter what I do for God as long as it is rooted in this confidence of who he is and this perspective of who he is and who I am in relationship to him. Humility will be the fruit. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed and you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. Salvation is the great equalizer. Humility is not something I can fight for or strive for. It is a fruit of my internal reality. 
Now, leading into my third point, I wanted to share a personal testimony. Now, some of you know I paint. By painting, I mean I paint uh, pictures. In fact, I've painted for as long as I've been able to hold you know, a, you know, a pencil or a paintbrush. I've, I've done drawing, I've done painting for, for years now. I think it's part of everyone's journey of transformation in relationship with Jesus that you know, we contend with self-worth. You know, there's a need in all of us to be significant in some way. And for me, that significance I try to find in painting. I try to find it in the label of Ben the Painter. I try to use my paintings, I try to display my paintings as a way to get validation, to get compliments. I mean, it's not a healthy way <laughs> at all to try and, and have yourself uh, validated. But that's what I did for, for many seasons. And the problem, however, though, with trying to define yourself and your self-worth through an ability is that in, invariably and inevitably, there is going to be somebody better than you. And if you are fully or even partially, if your self-worth is fully or partially wrapped up in your ability, when you're confronted with that reality, that doesn't do your self-confidence a lot of good. And so that led me down the horrible path of perfectionism within my work. I tried to be perfect in what I presented because I needed to be able to find my validation through a perfect painting that I could show off. Now, it wasn't all doom and gloom. There were certain works that I, that I did that I was happy with and even had the opportunity to do some illustration work for a book that was published through a teacher of mine. I say I was happy with them, but that was you know, as long as I got rid of them, as long as I passed them on to, to somebody else before I, before I had the opportunity to make too many changes because you know, perfectionism never ends. <laughs> perfectionism became such a stumbling block such a source of frustration that I actually stopped painting for 12 years. It wasn't until my relationship with God became what it is now, a healed, transformed relationship with God. I'd seen so much major growth over the last few years with uh, you know, my, my standing with God because I just took the time to spend with him, to get him to pour into me, to ask the hard questions. And it was from that place of healing, that place of transformation, that I started to feel the pressure to paint again. My motivation had changed because my heart was in a, a different place and my sense of self, who I was, who Ben is, who Ben was meant to be was now wrapped up in who God had made me to be, entirely wrapped up in God. About three years ago, I bought new painting supplies and I put together my first complete work after those 12 years and I was happy with the result. And to make a long story short, which involved me saying, no God, I don't think I should, and God saying, actually, yes, you should, my second painting was actually done here at Light City during worship. And that was a huge step of vulnerability. That was, oh, that was a step of faith. <laughs> um, because I was not allowed to have a perfect finished work I had to allow people to see the process and, you know, whether it was good or not, that's what people were going to see. But it was a turning point in the gift of painting that God had put in me before I was even born. Now, painting for me has become an expression of my relationship with God. Painting, and it's not just a finished product. It's, it's not just being able to display a truth that I feel God is wanting me to display on canvas or on paper, but it's a process itself. Some of the greatest times of worship I've had has been in painting. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that there is a partnership with the Holy Spirit because I look at some of the paintings I do and I'm like, that is not fully me. He has his stamp on it. And it is a privilege to use what he has put inside of me to express his glory to be seen by others. There are supernatural assignments that God is asking us to partner with him in. And I think it's important to note that part of my journey was found within the corporate setting. We are called to express our abilities and giftings within a group, within the body of Christ. We are called to encourage one another to lift one another, another up, to serve one another, and through our giftings and abilities, in the unique way that God has made each and every one of us, operating in a healed place together, we will indeed be greater than the sum of its parts. 
And I truly believe that is where people will find healing and transformation. It is within the safety of the body of Christ. As I was going through my transformation process, there was a verse that I held on to uh, that uh, was very encouraging, and I'm going to share with you, and it's from Exodus 31, 1 to 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. This is God saying this. And I personally have appointed Oholiab, son of Ahisamach, hopefully I pronounced that right, of the tribe of Dan, to be his assistant. Moreover, I have given special skill to all the gifted craftsmen so that they can make all the things I have commanded you to make. This passage highlights that God places and gives us the abilities that he wants us to use in conjunction with the power of the Holy Spirit to display his glory and further his kingdom. Art, for me, is always going to be an important part of who I am. It doesn't define me anymore. It's, it's not part of how I define my self-worth, but it is something that I believe God has put inside of me to be able to express in a healthy way. And I can say, yes, that I'm good at painting. And there's no boasting, there's no pride, because I know that whatever good is in me comes from God and God alone. My perfectionism has been replaced with a desire for excellence. It has left me to be teachable. I now know that being a good steward means that I also have to learn. I have to learn from others. I have to teach myself. I have to always be able to bring my best, but my best has to go from glory to glory because we move forwards in the kingdom of God. And this brings me to my last point, and it's short and sweet. With great power comes great responsibility. And for those, <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you in the know, uh, this is actually a quote widely attributed to the Spider-Man franchise, specifically Uncle Ben in the 2002 Spider-Man movie, where Uncle Ben is sharing this word of wisdom with, uh, with Peter Parker. You know, as Peter is struggling with his newfound superpowers as Spider-Man, it was an admonishment you know, for Peter to use his newfound great strength for the benefit of others, not himself. And to be honest, there have been so many variations of that phrase throughout the years, and invariably it comes from Luke 12, 48, which finishes with this. It says, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. This highlights just how important it is to live and function in the identity of children of God. Remember that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We have been created with purpose in mind. Our original design is and always will be about the mandates that God places in front of us. Each and every one of you has dreams put inside of them. God-given dreams that he wants you to express. Each and every one of you has been made with gifts, abilities, talents, passions, God-given talents and passions that need to be expressed because the stakes are too high for the children of God not to walk in that identity. It is not selfish or it is not arrogance to walk in that identity. It is not humility to deny who we are as long as our heart stays in the right perspective of God. You could be the richest, most successful person on the face of the planet and still be humble. And you could be the poorest, most failure-ridden person on the face of the planet and still deal with the issue of arrogance. It is our mandate, however, to always put others first to lift others up, to encourage others, to defend others. We are blessed to be a blessing. And it is a position of humility, a position of correct standing 
with God that allowed God or allows God to lift us up to new heights in Him, so that we may lift other people up to new heights in Him. Humility is something that is a heart response, not to sound like a broken record. It's so important. We align ourselves with what God has said is, who he is, who we are. In humility, we remain teachable. In humility, we do not say, who me or why me? We say yes. In humility, God can bless us. In humility, God can raise us up. In humility, we reach new heights. We're going to do something a little different now. I am just asking for you to join me and online as well, Buffalo and whoever's watching online, just join me in taking the time to ask these questions. I'm going to ask some, some prayers to Holy Spirit. And I want you, everyone, you know, eyes closed to repeat after me. And we're going to take some time to see what Jesus wants to say to our hearts today. So I just ask you now, if you will, just close your eyes and let's take the time to ask these questions. So pray in, you know, out loud if you feel comfortable, pray in your heart, but ask these questions. Holy Spirit, are there lies I believe about myself or you that prevent me from trusting Father God completely? And just take the time. Thank you, Holy Spirit. second question is this. Holy Spirit, are there things in my life that I look to for validation that are not who you have made me to be? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. gentle leading or gentle nudging as always Holy Spirit thank you and the third and final question is this Holy Spirit are there dreams or giftings or abilities that you have placed in me that need to be redeemed or restored to their original purpose close out my message, I'm just going to pray just a blessing over you for this time. And um, just open your hearts. Open your hearts to your Creator. Open your hearts to what He wants to say to you in this time as we look to this new season. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for the privilege of partnering with you, for what you want to see happen in our lives, in our, in our close circles, in our, in our lives, our families' lives, our friends' lives, in the lives of the people of Fort Erie, in the lives of the people of Buffalo and beyond. Father, in your absolute wisdom, you have chosen us to be your hands and feet. And it's not, uh, it's not up to us to say why, but it's up to us to say yes. So let our yes be a full yes this morning. Let our yes every morning be a resounding yes because your mercies are new every day. You are doing new things. Always, God, because we are always moving forward in you. And I pray that blessing over everyone 
watching today, ever, everyone who is here today, over everyone who will be watching in the future, the blessing of just a greater knowledge of who you are and who you have made them to be. In your name, Jesus, I pray that. Amen.